Okay, well I think we should get started, and if other people come, we'll welcome them as they dribble in. Um, are you ready over here? Yeah. Cool. Alright, so welcome to the Sacred Hunt Talk. Uh, my name is Murphy Robinson. I run a company called Mountain Song Expeditions up in Worcester, Vermont. And um, I, my main line of work is teaching people to hunt and teaching people archery. Um, so I thought I'd come here to the co-op and answer some questions for folks who are interested in this like local sustainable source of meat. Um, so this talk is designed for people who are curious about hunting, probably haven't hunted before, and want to know like what it takes to get into hunting. We're going to really line out what you actually have to do to get into this um, so that you can understand the process. Because I was someone who was not raised in a hunting family. I was raised by vegetarians, and um, I didn't learn to hunt until I was 27 or 28. Um, so I know how intimidating it can be to try and approach this whole culture and practice of hunting when you don't have like a family mentor. So I'm going to try and like demystify it. Um, so um, probably one of the questions people have is like, why am I calling this a sacred hunt? What's that about? Um, and sacred hunt is a terminology I use just to talk about hunting that we're approaching in a really mindful way and a way that connects us from nature rather than disconnects us from nature. Um, some of the dialogue about hunting in the wider culture is a little bit about like, you know, trophy hunting and like dominating nature and that sort of thing. And so this is distinct from that. It's really about the attitude you bring to it. I think that anyone can do a sacred hunt and make up what, what that means to them. Uh, for me, some of what that means is being a really ethical hunter, following all of the laws in your state, um, being safety oriented, not being reckless. Um, also respecting your prey as a, a fellow being and offering respect and honor to that creature and the sacrifice that they're making to help you feed your family. Um, also using every part of the animal that you harvest, every part that you know how to use and doing your best with that. Um, obviously like using all of the meat on the animal and you can boil down the bones for bone broth, you can tan the hide high tanning classes for people who want to learn how to do that um, and you know not everyone has all of the knowledge to like use the intestines or you know certain parts we may just give back to the forest give to the coyotes return them to the cycle um, but continuing to learn about how to use all the parts so that you're when you're taking the sacrifice of a life you're really honoring all of it um, is an important part of it for me um, I also like to engage with the concept of consent as I hunt, which sounds really strange to some people because you're killing something and you're sneaking up on it to kill it, you know, so it doesn't seem like a very consensual process. Um, but on a kind of spiritual level, I like to think about um, putting forth prayer that is consent oriented to the animal. The, like a, a prayer that I do at the beginning of every hunt is here in Vermont, it's bucks only for rifle hunting. And so I pray that like, may the buck who is ready to die for his people, to sacrifice himself so that there will be more food for the rest this winter, and to die cleanly, and to have his story told every time his flesh is eaten. May that buck come to me, and if no buck like that is in this forest, then may no buck come to me. And just sort of put it, put out an intent that like the right animal will come to me, and, and will die in a way that's clean, and that will feed the ecology of the deer herd in general. Um, so that's how I'm kind of bringing in that concept of consent. Um, and also the sacred hunt is usually accompanied with some kind of offerings or prayers. Um, you know, some people offer some sacred herbs or they'll sing a song or they'll just take a little time to like grieve over the animal and, and mourn its death. Um, and yeah, just being in touch with the emotional flow that you go through as a hunter or huntress um, as you're engaging in that cycle. It's a very intimate way of interacting with our meat. It's very different than just buying it in the store. Um, so I'm going to go through seven steps of what you need to do if, to go from like zero to actually going out for a hunt. Um, so the first step, of course, is to know the laws in your state. Um, you need to take a hunter safety class in order to legally hunt uh, anywhere in North America. You only have to take it once. You can take it in any state and it's good in all the other states and Canada and Mexico. Um, which is kind of amazing because the hunter safety that we do here in the States is much less involved than the one they teach in Canada, but they still have reciprocity with our class. Um, and uh, so it's just something you have to do once. It's free, at least in Vermont. I think some states might have a small charge. Um, 
And mo most of the hunter safety classes are taught as a partial home study course where you do a bunch of the material online and you take some quizzes and then you go in for just one eight hour day of a field day where they actually watch you shoot and make sure you can handle a gun safely. Um, and those are offered by the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department for free. Um, I'm a hunter safety instructor and a lot of other people are. It's all volunteer and um, they're, they're really good programs. So they do a good job. Um, so when you're, you've gone through this hunter safety class, you also need to make sure that you know the hunting laws in your state or in any state that you're going to hunt in. You know, I've hunted in five or six different states, so you've got to like study the laws in the, in the state where you're going. Um, and you have to purchase a hunting license. Um, some, in Vermont there's a program where if you're the landowner, sometimes you don't have to have a license, but you still need to know all the laws and you need to make sure that you're, you're legal in all of those ways. Um, so, and this is a picture of me with a button buck that I harvested in Iowa in a shotgun hunt. Uh, my family lives in Iowa, so I was out there. And um, this is an example of knowing the hunting laws in your state, because in Vermont, during uh, firearm season, it would not be legal to harvest a deer that didn't have antlers of a certain size. But in Iowa, the deer herd is much more prolific, and they're just begging you to harvest all the deer you can so that they can keep the herd healthy. So, um, step two is to know your hunting weapon. Um, I get a lot of people coming to me with questions about bow hunting, with the belief that bow hunting is somehow more like ethical and fair. Um, I like to challenge that a little bit and ask people to think about what is humane. Um, and bow hunting takes a lot of skill, it's a very advanced skill, both in terms of the practice you put in for marksmanship, and also you need to get a lot closer to a deer with a bow than you do with a gun in order to harvest with a bow. So that just takes a lot of hunting skill, of putting yourself in the right place at the right time. Um, so it is, it's, it's harder to have the kind of early success that would keep you going in this fairly difficult pursuit. Um, and you also definitely wouldn't want to have a bad experience where you wounded an animal but weren't able to harvest it um, the first time. So bow hunting is an amazing, awesome challenge. I definitely encourage people to bow hunt. But I do encourage people, if you're just starting out, to start with firearms hunting um, here in Vermont, that I mean rifle hunting. Um, and, you know, start hunting with a rifle and then start shooting your bow at the same time. And in five years, maybe put the two together by like build up your skill sets with both first because you'll learn a lot just from hunting with a firearm that you can then apply to hunting with a bow. Um, so there's a lot of choices. Um, in Vermont, we have a 16 day rifle season. Um, season timing and length varies in different states. Um, we also have a separate muzzle loader season for black powder firearms, um, which are considered a little bit more of a challenge for hunting because you only have one um, projectile that you're shooting. You don't have like a whole magazine with more that you can load quickly. Um, and you can also shoot a shotgun either with a slug, which is sort of like a bullet that goes in a shotgun, or with buckshot. And the city of Montpelier, where we are right now, is a good example of a place where you might use buckshot because that's the only legal way to hunt in Montpelier is to use shot. The reason is that shot does not travel very far, and this is a very densely settled area, so you don't want rifle bullets flying around Montpelier because they go over a mile if they're not stopped, um, whereas shot will only go, you know, a couple hundred yards. Um, so you'll want to evaluate where you're hunting and what the laws are. For example, in Massachusetts, you can only hunt with a shotgun. They don't have a rifle season. Same in Iowa, where I harvested that button buck. Uh, they only are a shotgun state. Um, so, and they have a few very strange, like, handgun and weird rifle calibers that are allowed, but I don't own those guns, so I had to get a shotgun to, to hunt there. So know the laws where you are and what would be appropriate, and then you need to acquire um, a rifle or whatever firearm you're looking at and make sure you understand the safe use and get training and have a lot of practice with marksmanship so that you're not questioning yourself. You don't want to be sitting in that tree stand looking at a buck and have this worry in the back of your head of like, oh, but is my marksmanship good enough? Because that's going to like throw you off. You want to know that it's good enough. Um, and whether you're shooting with a bow or with a gun, you always want to stay within your effective range, and that's very individual. You know, maybe for you, your effective range is 60 yards, which is fairly close, um, and you know, for a, for a rifle anyway. And you just need to be able to estimate that distance and and you know commit to staying within that distance. And then as your marksmanship improves, maybe you could shoot out to 150 yards or more. Um, and knowing that is the way to be ethical with whatever weapon you choose. And if you are interested in getting into bow hunting. 
Um, there's a couple different types of bows you can use. I brought a few examples. I didn't bring guns because we're in the co-op and I didn't think they'd like that. But um, this is an example of a compound bow, which is what most people are using for hunting these days with all the complicated pulleys and everything. Um, these have uh, a lot of advantages. Um, mostly that when you pull the string all the way back, there's a, a way that it's geared that it's easy to hold back at full draw. Whereas with a traditional bow, um, it's you know, the most difficult to hold back at full draw. You often have to sit there for a while and wait for the animal to turn correctly or whatever. Um, and you, you can exhaust your arm with a more traditional bow and this gives you an advantage there. Um, you need to make sure you're hunting with the right arrows and the right tips. They need to have broad heads in order to be legal for hunting. Um, I'm mostly talking about deer hunting, but for whatever we do. Oh, looks like I took the broad heads out. Probably when I was hunting in Minnesota, so I can't show you those. But um, there are also traditional bows that are wonderful for hunting. Um, this is a Korean traditional bow. That is a sort of smaller, shorter example of a recurve bow. Some people also hunt with long bows. Um, and this can also be very effective if you know your effective range and stick within it. Um, hunting poundages for bows, the, many states have a minimum poundage of like how much weight you're pulling back, how much force the bow is putting into that arrow. Um, in a lot of states, it's 35 or 40 pounds minimum for deer hunting. Vermont does not have a minimum for deer hunting. There is a minimum for moose hunting, I believe. Either bear or moose, I believe it's moose. It's like a 55 pound draw. But, um, most of my students, I, I work a lot with women and trans people, and most of my students can't pull a hunting weight bow when they walk into the range for the first time. It takes building up some muscle, unless you're someone who, you know, you work in a warehouse, you already have that muscle, um, then maybe you can jump right into it. But usually you need to get a bow of a lighter weight so that you can learn on a bow that's correctly matched to your strength and learn good form, and then you can slowly work up to that weight, and some bows have interchangeable limbs and everything so it's a little easier to make that transition or like this bow has adjustments you can turn to make it harder uh, to pull back and put more force into the arrow. Um, but again I usually recommend that people start with rifle hunting and also start shooting a bow which is really fun just as a fun thing to do um, and then put the two together down the road after you've had some success with the gun. And um, there are lots of places to get training in safety and marksmanship with both the gun and the bow. Um, I teach archery classes up in Worcester at my place. And for rifle marksmanship, um, in some of my longer hunting training programs, we do have some marksmanship training over time. Um, but another program that I recommend is the Appleseed Trainings. Um, they are put on by this organization that promotes U.S. Revolutionary War history and proper marksmanship and like argues that proper marksmanship was like why we won the war or something like that. I don't know, their politics are kind of interesting but they offer really, really good uh, marksmanship training that's based on military training models and has really helped me become much more confident with a gun. So you can look them up. And they're quite affordable, it's like 60 bucks for a weekend. Um, and they teach all over the U.S. So once you've selected your weapon, um, you need to make sure that you understand how to make a safe shot. Because um, especially if you're using a rifle, which is what I'm recommending people start with, um, those bullets can go over a mile if they aren't stopped by something. Um, so basically you should only shoot when you know your bullet is going to be stopped by something, even if you don't hit the deer. You know, the deer will to some degree stop it. But, um, so the basic principle is you're always shooting into the ground. Um, and luckily in Vermont we have a lot of terrain, so shooting into a hillside is not that hard to do. Um, but uh, there's something called skylining an animal, where you know you see that beautiful big stag up on the hilltop with his back against the sunset and like the, just you know, silhouetted against the sky, and that is not a shot that you should ever take because if he moves or you miss, then that bullet is going to keep on going for at least a mile, probably more and it's gonna hit something and possibly kill something when it finally stops. Um, there have been people in Vermont that have been killed by stray bullets that somehow wove their way through forests without hitting the trees for a mile and then killed a person. Um, so you need to be very, very careful about that. And uh, you know that bullet is your responsibility after you pull the trigger. Um, one thing that can help with shooting into the ground is be positioning yourself in a tree stand 
which also helps for a lot of other reasons because it kind of gets you up out of the scent zone of the deer and it's just a little bit more hidden. Um, but if you're in an elevated tree stand, then you're sort of automatically shooting down towards the ground um, wherever you're shooting, um, unless you have a very steep hill falling away from you. So I recommend them for safety for sure. Um, also gets you up out of other people's shooting trajectories, which is nice as well. Um, you should also be careful about shooting towards water. Um, should, water can actually ricochet a bullet using the surface tension because of the speed of what goes on. You know, it doesn't always happen, but it can happen, and that would be very bad. Um, and also rocks. You know, there's a lot of like big outcroppings of rock in our mountains, and those could potentially ricochet a bullet a little bit too. Which I mean, it's, it's not going to ricochet like all the way back at you. That would be very unlikely. But uh, you don't know where it's going to go, so you want to be in control of that bullet going into the ground or into a tree, or hopefully into your deer. Um, and that goes for practice as well as for hunting. You need to find a place to practice. If it's not at a shooting range, which is all set up for that, a place to practice that you're definitely shooting into a hill. And also being aware of lead. If you're using lead bullets, you can invest in non-lead bullets, which are better for the environment, but they do cost more. And they're harder to source. And um, you are putting lead into the ground wherever you're practicing your shooting. So um, shooting ranges are set up for that. But your home spot, you'd want to pick a spot that wasn't in a drainage. Um, okay, so step four. Now we've acquired our weapon, we've practiced with it, we feel confident, we understand a safe shot, but there's also a lot of clothing and gear involved. Um, you can see this is a hunt that I led in North Carolina, and we are all extremely bundled up. <laughs> and this is North Carolina, it's not nearly as cold as Vermont, you can see there's no snow on the ground. But if you are being still, and most types of successful beginning hunting involve sitting and in a place where the deer will be passing by you versus trying to stalk up on a deer, which is very advanced. Um, if you're sitting still early in the morning or as the sun is setting, you're going to get very, very cold. So you need to dress in many, many layers. I usually have like seven layers on my top and three on my bottom and really big winter snow boots, even though it's not snowy out. Uh, you can kind of see I've got some like wool pants here and like a down jacket and a hooded jacket under my camo raincoat and all of that. Um, so coming up with a layering system that works for you is really important with special attention to fingers and toes. Um, especially for people who are assigned female, um, tend to have worse circulation in the extremities a little bit. Not always, but for, for many people. Um, and so I get like arctic rated boots. I like the ones made by Baffin. Um, they're really good. And also use toe warmers. Um, because one of the number one things that can prevent someone from getting a deer is if your toes are just too cold for you to stay in the tree stand. <laughs> and that has happened to multiple people that have come on my hunting trips. They're just like, I can't do it anymore. Um, and you know, there's no way you're going to get a deer if you're not out in the woods. Um, and fingers too, you know, your fingers are pulling your bow or pulling your trigger and so they need to be warm and flexible and ready to go. Um, and uh, so they make uh, mittens that will sort of fold back and, and reveal your fingers so that you can have that dexterity when you need it. Or you can wear like liner, liner gloves and put them inside some big fluffy mittens. Or some mittens actually have a trigger finger separate and the rest is a mitten. There's all kinds of special things you can get. Um, but with a little creativity, you should be able to put together something that works that isn't too expensive. Um, and then you're going to want to have a little backpack with you of some sort because there's stuff you need to bring. Both basic gear like map and compass, knife, first aid kits, water, food, that sort of thing. Some way to communicate is good. You know, cell phones don't always work in the mountains, but it's nice to have one in case you have a deer and you're going to be dragging it out and you want to call some friends for help. Um, some way to communicate is, is recommended if it's possible. Um, and you also need to carry a certain amount of stuff that you wouldn't carry on like a day hike or something like that that's for recovery of that animal. Um, so you need your hunting license to be on you. You need your hunting tag to be on you because you're going to need to attach that to the deer before you move it. Um, you're going to need uh, some kind of pen or a sharpie to like write down the date and time that you shot it. That's part of the legal tagging process. Um, I like to bring some latex gloves or nitrile gloves out in so that I can field dress it and then just take off the gloves because it's probably not running water right there that I can clean my hands off with. It's just easier. Um, and you know, whatever kind of knife with a gutting hook or something like that you need for field dressing. 
Uh, I like to bring some Ziploc bags for putting the organs in, so we want to take all the organs out so the animal cools faster, but some of, a lot of the organs are very good to eat. Um, so whatever you need to like, again, use all the parts of the animal. Um, and then whatever you need to haul that animal out, like a rope or um, there's like special harnesses for hauling beer and stuff like that. So you need all that to fit into a day pack and you need that to be comfortable so that you, again, can stay out for as long as you want to and have a better chance of finding that deer. Um, step five is to really learn the ground that you're going to be hunting. Um, there's all kinds of different ways to get land access in Vermont. State-owned land is mostly open to hunting. Um, and state forest land is all open to hunting. Um, but then there's also private land. And if that land is posted in Vermont, then you need to have written permission in your pocket to be on that, that land hunting. Um, posted land can be some of the best hunting land. You just have to have a good relationship with the landowner so that they trust you and they welcome you onto their land and they know you're not going to trash things. Um, and some people are, you know, just against hunting and will not say yes, but many people will and they've just had bad experiences with people being rude on their land. Um, so you want that permission with you. And then you really want to like scout the land that you're going to be hunting because you need to put yourself in the right place. You know, Vermont's rifle season is only 16 days long and it's, you know, you can't just be wandering and tramping all around there. You've got to be like deliberate and strategic about it. So you're going to be looking for rubs and scrapes, which are um, buck sign for, for the rut. So like here's an old, um, old rub that Meg is demonstrating. She's a deer tracker here. And um, they make scrapes on the ground where they scrape with their hooves and then they like pee in it. It's sort of like a little voicemail box where they exchange hormonal messages with the bucks and the does. Um, and other sign like scat and tracks and whatever you can, you know, beds in the grasses that can help you figure out like where are the deer traveling between at different times of day. Like where do you want to sit in the morning? Where do you want to sit in the evening? Where is the general wind direction coming from? Because the smell is their number one sense for telling if they're in danger. Um, you also want to look for the food. So deer are going to go to the food source. You know, if you have access to hunting over an old apple orchard, that's amazing. You're going to have good luck with your hunting. Um, but otherwise, you've got to figure out what are they eating in the forest, go in, you know, see where the sign is, see where things have been nibbled, try and figure that out, um, where their travel corridors are. And some people do use game cameras for this, like find what they think is a game trail and put a camera out there and you can get a picture and it'll have a timestamp on it. You'll know what time the deer is passing through there. A lot of game trails are only used at night and we can't hunt after dark. Um, so you got to figure out where they're going to be in daylight. Um, and then, you know, some people think that the game camera is kind of like a cheat, um, but also most of us have full-time jobs and like can't just spend all of our time getting to know the wildlife patterns of the land, so it can actually be a really helpful aid in the modern world. Um, and you want to think about tree stand placement. If you have permission to put a tree stand on this land, like where is the, are the places you're going to want to go most frequently and putting up the stand well ahead of time so that the deer get used to it and don't consider it a threat. Um, you want to give them like a month to get used to it at least. Um, so that's some of the steps of learning your hunting ground. There's a lot of work to put into that. And then you want to have a good plan for game recovery. This is one of the biggest questions I get in my classes, um, especially from women or anyone who has like a little bit less brute strength um, that are asking like, well, how do I get the deer out of the woods? That's <laughs> a really good answer. I actually like to think about this when I plan where I'm going to be hunting. I like to hunt uphill from a road, not downhill from a road, because I don't want to haul a deer up the, up the trail. Um, but uh, once you've made a shot and you, you've connected with an animal, um, often that animal does not just fall right where you shot it. Sometimes it does, I've had that experience, but even if it's a very good shot, it will often run a short ways. Um, yeah, there's just that much like life left in an animal, even if you shot it straight through the heart, that it can still run a little ways. So our bodies are amazing that way. Um, and so you may have to follow a blood trail. Um, and that involves, you know, waiting a little while, letting the, the forest calm down. The deer will, if it's a good shot, the deer will probably expire. If you give it like half an hour, just sit there and wait. Um, and then go down to the point last seen, see if you can find drops of blood and start following that trail and find out where that animal has, you know, retreated to someplace that feels safe, probably in some brush, probably a little bit hard to find. Um, you can see here, this is one of my hunting students, Cecilia, recovering her first deer down in North Carolina. 
and um, it's kind of like managed to get itself way uh, in under there, you know, found a, a little spot. It's like surprisingly not obvious, you know, it's the same color as the leaves. Um, so you have to be prepared to do some tracking. Um, you may also want to bring some flagging tape so that you can flag your way back. Because um, you could track it for a while. If it was a good shot, it shouldn't be that far. If it was not the best shot you've ever made, it might, you might be going a ways. And you owe it to that animal to recover the body and to use it, but you also want to be able to find your way home. <laughs> so bringing some flagging tape can be really good. You need to confirm that the animal is fully dead. Sometimes they look dead, but um, people have been very badly injured by deer that weren't actually dead that can kind of leap up and do a little last bite thing. Um, so the way that we recommend to confirm death is to take a long stick and touch it to the eyeball of the deer. Um, and if it doesn't blink, it's dead. That's good for any, any mammal that I've tried to confirm death on. Um, and uh, then you want to be able to field dress the animal. Most, unless it's right next to a road, then you might just take it home first. But most people are going to remove the guts and organs before they haul it out. Because A, it makes it a lot lighter. Like a pretty high percentage of the deer's weight is in its stomach and organs. Um, and it, it helps the carcass cool faster so the meat won't spoil. Um, so you want to have materials with you for that. And then dragging strategies um, include having friends you can call. I like to have a list of people that are available like both in the evening and during working hours that I could call if I have a really long drag. Um, a lot of people will use a sled, like a snow sled, um, that even if it's like this and there's no snow on the ground, it's still a lot easier to pull a deer on a sled than to pull a deer just on the ground. Um, so some people like keep a sled in their truck or something and then you'll get it if they get a deer. Um, having rope is really helpful, um, or even like little harnesses that you can tie to the deer so you can pull in a way where you're not like bent over and crouched and you know potentially kind of injuring yourself. Um, and then again, that carrying that flagging tape is really helpful for recovery as well. So step seven, the last step in in my personal set of steps here, is to really spend some time reflecting on your personal ethics and your spiritual beliefs around this. Um, because the moment when you do harvest your first deer is a very emotionally intense moment and you want to be prepared for that. Um, you want to have done some reflecting and not let it catch you off guard. Um, grief is definitely a part of hunting. It's very, very healthy for us to grieve the death of a beautiful, strong, living animal. Even if we know that we're doing it for reasons that we're aligned with and that it's coming to feed our family and all of that. Um, this is Jojo harvesting her first deer in North Carolina with us. Um, she came on this hunt for her 60th birthday and was able to get, get her first deer on this hunt. And she just made an offering and really just allowed herself to feel those emotions flowing through her and had a really beautiful moment with this deer and the immensity of the gift it was giving. Um, Many people like to prepare some kind of offering or prayers. Um, Jojo here brought some dried apple and kind of gave it a little last bite after death of the apple that was from her land. Um, and there can, for some people, there's like highs and lows that come after this experience of like, there, there can be a euphoria of like, whoa, I just did this really hard thing that I've <laughs> probably spent years into preparing for. Um, and like the, the joy of success and then there's also the grief that comes with that, and it's like this whole tangle of emotions that's very unique, but anyone who's experienced that can understand what you're talking about. It's, it's kind of an initiation. And there can sometimes be an emotional load that follows that afterwards, you know, after that initial rush of energy and activity around the harvest of like really sitting with that. And um, one thing that that's brought me to is a lot of reflections around how do we live in order to deserve this sacrifice. You know, the, the deer is just giving us the ultimate gift. And I don't feel, especially as someone who's raised a vegetarian, I don't actually feel that I need meat in my diet to be healthy. Um, but I do feel like it's a very sustainable, local form of nourishment that connects me to the earth and connects me to the spirit of the deer. And I know that if I'm going to be engaging in this practice, I really need to be living my life in an authentic way where I'm like bringing my gifts to the world and I am doing everything I can, can for positive change and to, to care for the environment and everything um, in order to deserve that sacrifice. Um, so it's been a really good thing that sort of holds me accountable in my life. Um, 
I also personally have a practice around contacting the spirit of a dead deer, uh, a deer that I um, shot, or sometimes I'll do it this for roadkill that I harvest as well, um, and uh, going through a practice of what has often been called shamanism, but I just call it spirit journeying because that's a very specific term from uh, Siberia for that culture. But um, to do some kind of spirit journey and, and to really like ask the spirit of that deer, is there anything I can do for you? Like what can I offer in exchange? And, and to you know, see if you get any inspiration or any guidance around what you can do to be in reciprocity with the deer. Um, for this gift that it's given and go out and do some acts of service and you know maybe you're not the type who wants to get all woo-woo about it but you can still think in your logical brain of like what can I do to give back to this ecosystem that's feeding me and try and do some you know service on the land or something like that it also really helps to have a supportive community around you um, many of the people that I teach are folks who don't have a hunting background in their family and may not have a circle of friends that are bought into hunting as, as something that you can do ethically. And so it's really important to have community that is okay with this thing you're doing and willing to support you through it. <laughs> um, that's, that's something that I've had to develop for myself. And there is a ton of supportive community in the more traditional, handed down, father to son hunting community that's sort of built in. And those of us who are building this new hunting community for ourselves really have to look harder for it and to find that reinforcement of, of community. Um, I also really like to honor the meat in, in special ways when I cook it, like cook it for big gatherings, share it with people, and to, yeah, um, to do some storytelling around it and make sure that that deer um, gets its story told. Like what was that hunt like? What were the special things about it? I think my computer has just died because I'm maybe not plugged into a live outlet. So I'm just gonna, that was the, pretty much the last slide. I'm just gonna rip on the rest of it. But, um, and yeah, any, anything that you can, that feels appropriate to offer as a gift in that moment, you may wanna think about it, prepare ahead of time, you know, write a, write a story about that hunt, make a poem, write, compose a song, just say some prayers, um, do things that honor the immensity of the exchange that you're taking part in. And it's, it's funny because we're all, anyone who eats meat is taking part in that exchange all the time, but we're not mindful about it because we're removed from it. And becoming a deer hunter is an incredibly intimate way to engage with that cycle and to really understand what we're doing every time we put a bite of meat in our mouths. And for me, that's been really humbling and really like, feels like a healthy thing to, to look in the face. Um, and so those are the seven steps. And I want to give you a couple of resources about where you can learn more. Um, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department is really excellent and very supportive of new hunters, um, especially non-traditional hunters, hunters who are women or uh, people of color or queer or trans or like the, everyone that I've worked with in the department has been incredibly supportive of all of that. It's very excited about sharing hunting with, with new groups of people. Um, and especially the people in the education part of the department, which is who I've mostly worked with. Um, and so you can con go on their website and sign up for a hunter safety course. That's a really good first step. And they also do offer some seminars on like different skills that people might want to learn um, that are taught by local folks who are really knowledgeable. Sometimes in those classes, I find you have to go in uh, like knowing what questions to ask because there can be just an assumption of a basic level of knowledge that not all of us actually have or have passed down in our families, but um, people are really willing to help if you can take the time to figure out what words to use as you tell the questions. <laughs> I've learned a lot from those folks. Um, and then I also offer a ton of different programs around hunting and archery. Um, my kind of flagship program is this two-day hunting skills intensive um, that I offer in the fall. There's one weekend that's just for women and trans people, and there's one weekend that's for all genders, so if people want to come with their boyfriends or their nephews or whatever, everyone's welcome at that one. Um, and uh, that walks through a lot of the skills that aren't covered specifically in the hunter safety class. It's designed to complement it. So the hunter safety class is for all types of hunting. It could be for waterfowl hunting or for turkey hunting or stuff like that. So they're not going to get into deer specific strategies. They're just really covering firearm safety. Um, so my class is specifically about deer hunting and what do you need to know to become a deer hunter and practicing those skills. And we do actually harvest an animal in the class. We slaughter a goat. Since it's not a very hunting season, we don't hunt. But um, we slaughter a goat, and people can learn field dressing and learn skinning and 
just experience um, interacting in a prayer prayerful way with death during that transition, and that can be a really good preparation for people and can help people discern whether or not this is something they want to pursue. Um, for people who know this is something they want to pursue, and they know, like, I want to harvest a deer this year, um, I offer an eight-month training where you come one weekend a month for seven months, and then you come on a seven-day guided hunt down south somewhere where there's a lot more deer than there are in Vermont, <laughs> and where you can shoot does and yearlings and everything, um, so that people have had very good success rates. We, uh, I mean, I don't want to promise anything, but so far we've had a 100% success rate on those trips. Um, and a lot of the photos that you saw today were from, from that one of those trips, or several of those trips. But, um, so that's like, really, it, hold, it holds your hand through the whole process, it takes you through a year of study, and it also like creates community amongst you and the other students so that you have that supportive community of people you can talk to about it that like have the same understanding you do. Um, and I also offer a bunch of archery classes, and this year for the first time I'm also offering a like sort of spiritual skills training for folks who want to develop more of a spiritual practice framework, whether it's in correlation with a hunt or not. Um, of, you know, how do you do this, like contacting the spirit of a deer, and how do you develop these prayers and practices and stuff like that. That's sort of an open source skill set that you can apply to any earth-based practice. Um, so there's flyers on the corner of my stuff, and um, for folks watching the video or, or anything like that, my website is mountainsongexpeditions.com, and you can find the information on all the programs there. Um, so those are the main places where you can learn more information. I hope this was helpful, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Um, I don't. Oh, great. Well, <laughs> I hope I, I covered things that were useful. Oh, oh yeah, you covered a lot. It looks great. Good. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Um, well, feel free to be in touch if you think of more questions later or yeah. want to have any more questions that, that come to you as you talk about this with others and things like that. Certainly will. I'm signed up for your email. Oh, so great. That. That's yes. awesome. <laughs> That's probably great. why I wanted to come. I wanted to meet you. I wanted to just oh, get a good. sense of, of um, because I'm interested in one of your classes. I just thought, well, I have a different spiritual belief. Than you, and I just totally. wasn't sure it would be a good match, but I feel good about it. I'm oh, that's good to hear. You, and, yeah. <laughs> and I really, I try very hard to keep the Huntress classes um, really open and accepting to all spiritual paths. You know, I, I don't like teach my own spirituality in them. Like, I, I create a space where we have conversations, and I have people who are Christian, and people who are Buddhist, and people who are Jewish, and everyone comes and kind of just brings their own perspective in it and is able to share from that perspective. And, and, that's, and that's the sense I got from you. Yeah. So. Cool. That's helpful. Sounds great. Yeah, I think it's a really powerful thing to include in our spiritual practice, and there's all kinds of ancient traditions around honoring our food and the animals that we're slaughtering and all of that that, like, mm -hmm. you know, Except for some of the kosher practices, I've largely like fallen to the wayside. So it's the way to sort of bring some back. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for coming. Thank you.